Okay, we'll get started then. Um, this talk is best practices for heterogeneous data stores, and unlike all the other talks that I've given this week, there is no code in it whatsoever, I am afraid. Okay? And um, so if you're at my earlier talks that were packed with code for <coughs> excellent, it'll be more of the same. There isn't any code, unfortunately. Mainly because I'm not able to download all of the databases and data stores that I'm talking about, have them installed on my laptop and have working codes to demonstrate them. Alright? So to stop that. To stop this turning into like death by PowerPoint, right? Because it's a best practices talk, so it's just going to be slide after slide after slide. So to stop it becoming really like death by PowerPoint, as I say, um, I hope we can get a bit of a discussion going. You know, when I put up the best practices and you guys um, disagree with me, then we can get in a bit of a discussion, and that way, um, you know, it'll turn into a bit of a better session. Otherwise, it's going to be death by PowerPoint. It'll probably last about an hour instead of ninety minutes because we'll just be going through the slides. The benefit of that, of course, is that we'll all get a wee early for an early lunch and you guys will all be in front of the queue um, when it comes to food. So, you know, participate or don't, it, it's kind of up to you. When I say these are best practices, right, these are not, these are not industry established best practices because, because basically this is not a solved problem. Heterogeneous data stores isn't a solved problem. Things change all of the time. If you're looking at this environment <coughs> and, and this landscape, you know, new things are coming along all of the time. So one of the things um, that that means is that there isn't really a settled um, in most of the areas, there isn't really a settled consensus on what best practice is. So when I actually say best practice, what I mean is it's stuff that I've done when I've been using these things which works. However, best practice, as it turns out, is a better phrase to use in a title for a talk than stuff I've done what worked. Um, so you guys may disagree. Um, and more importantly, I don't necessarily want you to go away and think, well, Gary said it had to be done this way, and so I'm going to stamp my fist and slam my foot on the ground or the other way around um, if I don't get my own way. It's just stuff that it's worked for me and it's really something for you to think about. All right? And then as I said, just to make the talk uh, not super boring, at the end I've, I've um, included a use case um, of one of the latest projects I've been working on where we, where we had a set of heterogeneous data stores um, in the solution just because that was, that was the, the best way to go. So I'm going to talk a bit about that at the end as well. So <coughs> this is me and um, if you're interested. Um, Actually, this slide is not particularly interesting. There's nothing particularly um, important on that. And um, basically, it tells you a bit about me and what I do. The only kind of interesting things or important things on that slide are the two bits at the bottom, where if you want to ask me questions or disagree with me, um, but don't want to do it to my face, um, then you can email me or you can get a hold of me on Twitter. Um, as I've said in all my talks so far, and as I mostly say, if you have a question, you're far more likely to get an answer if you contact me on Twitter. Not because I sit on Twitter all day when I'm supposed to be working, but your question can only be 140 characters long if you ask it on Twitter. Okay? And if you ask a question 140 characters long, you're far more likely to get an answer than if you email me seven pages. If you email me seven pages, you will still get an answer, don't get me wrong, but you just might not like it as much. Okay. So, best practices for what now? So, when I say heterogeneous data stores, what I mean is using more than one data store in your solution, okay? So traditionally, you know, you know the, the traditional um, architecture, we can all do traditional architecture in our sleep. You can't actually believe that people get paid money these days for what's called traditional architecture because everybody knows what it is. It's just box, box, cylinder, done, right? Everybody knows that, right? That's it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what it is you're designing, right? You have a look. And if, you and if you drill down low enough into the, into the um, architecture, it's just box, box, cylinder, finished, right? I don't, I don't know why Visio has any more diagram um, elements than that. That's, that's all you need, all right? But that's when the cylinder is your traditional um, RDBMS, okay? But things have moved on now, and we have different kinds of data, and those data um, are sometimes not particularly well suited to be stored in and RDBMS, all right? But we still have data, pretty much every solution is always going to have data. I mean, if you are an organization and you have customers, okay, pretty much that is a solved problem. Storage of customers, right? We've been doing that for a while now. That is a solved problem, right? Trust me, DBAs, they, they totally have that one owned, okay? 
So if you've got a business, you're pretty much going to have some kind of RDBMS there in the background anyway. Okay, simply because there's just so many tools around to help you with that that it would be stupid not to. But then, of course, you've got other data that's come on stream that doesn't really lend itself well to being stored in that RDBMS. And so now we have to find other data stores which are better suited to storing that kind of data. And so we've brought them on board as well. And so these days, we usually have um, solutions which have more than one kind of data store. Okay, and that can give us um, it can give us issues with which data should we store in which one. You know, just because we've got an RDBMS just exactly like when we had an RDBMS and it wasn't suitable for storing everything, right? We shouldn't just take in another data store, like a document data store, for example, and then basically store everything else in there, okay? Because the same thing applies. That's not necessarily the best way to store that data. And so we end up with maybe two or three different kinds of data stores in our solution. And we need a set of best practices, or as I said before, stuff what works um, for me. Um, and some of the issues and decisions that you're going to have to make when you're when you're bringing that in. So that's what I mean. So just by a show of hands just now, how many people have worked or are working on a solution right now that's got more than one kind of data store in it? So pretty much most of you. Excellent. So we should get some kind of discussion and some kind of um, disagreement when I start saying this is the thing you should do with this, right? And we'll also, just, just because I'm interested and for no real other value, we'll also talk about you know, when we get there what kinds of data stores. As we go through the data stores, I'll ask people. Um, I'll ask people what you know if they're actually using them and and which flavour. Because I'm going to talk. Um, I am going to talk generally about a data store. And I'm not going to name specific um, versions, for example. So I will talk about, for example, um, document data stores. I won't necessarily talk about MongoDB or CouchDB or RavenDB, for example. But it'd be interesting to see when we get to these bits which actual implementations you guys are uh, you guys are using. So the first thing that we need to talk about before we even talk about what kind of data store we're going to use is this kind of idea of kind of cutting the apron strings there, this kind of on-premises, off-premises kind of thing. And in general, you tend to find that all managers, I mean, I'm talking in general, obviously, your managers generally want to move everything into the cloud because if it isn't cheaper, then the costs are unmanageable. You know what they are up front, okay? You can calculate them. Whereas when you run your own data center, the costs are, to a certain extent, known, but you have no real idea. I mean, you, you understand how much your co-location is going to cost you. You understand how much um, you have to pay in, in staff costs to run and things like that. But you don't really have any idea with regards to how many hard disk failures you're going to have, you know, whether you're going to have to replace your servers, whether a patching of, this, of um, Microsoft latest patch is going to take out your servers for three days, because um, that never happens. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Whereas when you move everything into the cloud, it's much more manageable cost, right? It doesn't necessarily matter to managers if it's a little bit more, because more money is not necessarily in, in Important, it's the fact that it's unknown, it's quantifiable. Okay, you know what that cost is going to be. Whereas when you've got your own data centers, it's not necessarily so. So managers tend to generally want to heave everything into the cloud and go, yes, that's fine, we can forget about it. And <coughs> engineers and um, software architects and DBAs especially want to keep everything in-house where they can see it, you know, and um, they know all the data is there. And sometimes it's good to have stuff. Um, in the cloud, and sometimes it's just easy to have stuff on premises, okay? Especially if it's things like customer data, okay? Because as soon as you start holding customer data, as soon as you start holding data, which can be can identify a living individual, you are in the world of data protection, okay? And you have to satisfy the data protection legislation, all right? And it's people whose job that is, you know, to make sure that you are compliant. Um, it just gets a little bit more complicated when you say, "Why oh, put that in the cloud?" Well, did you know? Well, where's that? Oh, it's in the cloud. Well, is it still in the EU? Did you put that in? Did you put that in a, in a Azure data center in Dublin, for example? Or is it in continental Europe, which is fine? Or did you put it in the states? You know, are you allowed to move that data? Does your regulatory body allow you to move that data outside of the UK? Are you allowed to move it outside of the UK, but provided you tell somebody about it, you know, fill in the right form, in triplicate in line, okay, and then fax it to somebody. So there's all these kind of problems. So just by a show of hands, who's got, who's got data, uh, who's got a data mix on-prem and off-prem just now? All right, quite a few people. In your organizations, was, was that a hard sell to keep a mix? Did, did you feel that some people were wanting to stay 
um, on-prem, some people were wanting to heave it all in the cloud, or was it a pretty obvious split with your data, which we had to go? Yes, sir. So my experience was kind of the opposite. Um, our management wants to put everything into the cloud, and I'm one of the few people who's standing up and saying, hang on, we can't necessarily do that, because there's all sorts of regulations about individual and um, sort of customer confidentiality and so forth that we need to take into account. If it's in the cloud, you don't know where it is, and often you can't do it. So mm -hmm. it was actually trying to kind of rein people in a bit. Yeah, trying to, trying to bring them back. Yeah. Right. But did anybody else have any problems, or was it kind of an, an obvious kind of split as to where the on-prem, off-prem should be going? Our experience was the other way around, is that uh, it's really our management that we can securely hold uh, sensitive data in the cloud mm -hmm. is uh, the other challenge. And I grant you that is not an easy problem to solve. It, it isn't, actually. The whole idea of security, you know, isn't isn't an easy thing, you know, trying to convince people. Especially, I find as well that, that non-technical people don't really understand the difference between, oh, Dropbox has been hacked, oh, Apple's iCloud has been hacked, and all these naked photographs of celebrities are on, are, you know, on the internet, data security, as opposed to, well, this is in the Microsoft Azure data center in Dublin, right, which I believe has a tank trap. That fact alone just boggles my mind. I mean, who sat down and thought, when we secure this data center, right, we better make sure it has a tank trap, right? That kind of security, it's very difficult for non-technical people to actually separate that in their heads. They think, you know, because that has happened to Apple's iCloud, that their data in the cloud isn't necessarily as, as secure, you know? As if their data, as if, you know, Joe Bloggs' small, in relative terms, company, right, represents the same kind of target as you know celebrities iCloud's account to, to, to hackers and it's very difficult and some people just go no 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 the cloud isn't secure and it's much easier if we keep that data on prem and actually sometimes as as my american friends are um fond of saying sometimes the juice isn't worth the squeeze in that argument you know it, it doesn't really matter if there are really good technical reasons for moving your um secure data on-prem into the cloud. Sometimes it's just not worth having that argument. You go, do you know what, you're absolutely right, let's just keep it here, okay? Sometimes I find that an awful lot of people move, make the difference between, make the decision for on-prem and off-prem by saying, um, well, do you know what, we're just gonna keep everything we've got right now on-premises because we know that works and we're not gonna touch that, right? Because, you know, hey, if it's, if it's not broken, you know, don't fix it. And new stuff will push into the cloud. And what happens then is over the, over the period of a, of a few months or a, or a couple of years, you're then looking at this split between prem uh, on-prem and off-prem. It doesn't seem to make any sense of you know, why this data is on-premises and this data is off-premises, other than it's, it's purely historical. You know, it's just because it's always been like that. So I think the point here that, that I'm making is that you know, don't be afraid to have the mix. Don't think it has to be all or nothing. Okay? If it makes sense to keep some stuff on-prem, then do it. And if it doesn't, then you know, feel free to, to push it out onto, uh, into the cloud. Of course, as we, as we said um, in the discussion there, as soon as we start to move data off-premises, security becomes a worry. So there's a few best practices or things that you have to start to think about, okay? <clears throat> and this is something that, that you know, we, it happens all the time. And then when it happens, people go, well, that's ridiculous. You know, it's all this weak credential reset mechanisms, you know? Um, the reset mechanism gets written in the early days and before this whole idea of clear text passwords was a problem and you never go back and fix it. And yet you know. you know. In fact, not only do you know as a developer it's a bad idea, but when somebody, when you have a reset mechanism, and somebody sends your password in clear text to you in an email, you get pissed off about it, right? And then you think, but nobody actually sits down and goes, hmm, I wonder if we do that. What is, what's our um, mechanism? Who here has a password, like an online presence for the company who has that kind of um, reset mechanism? A Couple of people. Who's really confident that they don't send passwords in the reset mechanism? in clear text, right? So about a third of the people who put their hands up to say they have a mechanism put their hands up to say I'm confident that we don't do it that way, okay? But this is, this is one, of the, one of the most straightforward and leaky mechanisms inside your website for exposure for security is the fact that you send clear text passwords, right? Not necessarily even because you're sending them in the clear, right? It's because if you're sending them in the clear, pretty much guaranteed you're storing them in the clear as well. Right, and you just pulled that out and sent it on. 
This is another one. Weaker faulty authorization technique. So URL guessing, right? Who's, we've all we've all seen these. Um, we've all been to the sessions and security conferences and stuff like that, where guys have demonstrated by just hacking the URL in the web page, you can get to, to different places and places that you shouldn't be able to get to and say, oh, well, you know, if my account is this, then maybe what's so-and-so's account, and if I do this, I might get that. And this part here is obviously the ID number, so if I just mess around with ID numbers, do I get other people's? Because okay. who's seen that kind of thing before? Not only that, who's done that? Who's gone to like the BA website or, you know, whatever, and gone, oh, I wonder if I could mess around with this? Right, everybody here with their hands down is lying. Right? So we've all done that. It's like saying to people, who watches porn on the internet? No, no, no one ever does that, right? But it's a huge industry, so somebody must, right? It's the same with this kind of messing around, you know, stuff which is like, well, that's, that's below developers, surely developers. Are, no, they don't. We all sit there and they go, no, I wonder if they can do so and so. You know, it's that, it's that mentality that um, developers have of, you know, I wonder how this works. And especially testers. Testers especially do that because they have a totally different mentality from developers. You know, developers have this kind of mentality of, I wonder what I can build with that, that's really cool, right? Testers have this mentality to say, how can I break that? Right? It's like that little destructive little boy. Inside, inside every tester, right, there's a destructive child. Right? You know that they were the person with the broken dollies and the broken cars when they were uh, when they were kids. Oh, this works. How can I break this? Okay? They're the kind of people who go, oh, what if I can hack about in here? Another one is authorization at two course of granularity. We see this all the time, admin for everything. You know, you see it on things like the RDBMS and um, um, data stores where you know the password um, is, is just SA, you know, and then it's admin admin. Okay, see this a lot. Authorization of too coarse of granularity. Okay, too high an authorization for everything just to get stuff working. And of course, and once you have given somebody that high authorization, um, they can pretty much do what, whatever whatever they want. If you give them a high enough authorization, then they can get out of the sandbox that you think that they've they've given them in. Okay. Who's done that? Who's seen that? Who has done that? Actually, just going, oh, it works if you do this. Yeah, lots of people. Okay, so again, something to think about. Every time you go, every time you, th every time you find yourself having to give an elevated authorization mm -hmm. to, to a piece of code, you'd be thinking to yourself, one, does it really need to be at this level? Okay, and if it does need to be at that level, it's what is the minimum amount of time that I can give that person this elevated authorization for? You know, what's the minimum amount of work that they need to be able to do to get the job done at that level and then just cut them off? Why don't we cut them off? I mean, you know, rescind that authorization. Security to the facility. This is not, this is not a, a, a huge um, issue, but it, it is just something to think about. You know, especially, maybe not so much if you've gone with um, cloud providers like Microsoft or Amazon or, or um, Google or these kind of places. I mean, these facilities are ridiculously secure. Um, <clears throat> but you know, if you've gone with a, with a local company, perhaps, um, there are a number of local companies in Scotland that, that do server co-location and, and stuff like that. You know? And you need to be sure yourself that the place is secure, okay? And people just can't come in you know, willy-nilly, as it were. Now, you're not going to be able to just to drive up there and inspect it, especially if it's abroad, okay? You can't just go, well, you know, do you know what? You can't phone up Microsoft especially, or you can't phone up your local colo company and go, oh, by the way, I'm coming down tomorrow to inspect your facility. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, all right? But the way you can do that is there are certain um, ISO standards and security standards certificates that um, co-location organizations can get, right? And whilst if they don't have them, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that their premises are insecure because they might just have decided not to go for that certification. What it does mean if they do have that certification, you know everything that is, is proper and you can go, you can tick that box and say, yeah, I'm happy with that. Hardware virtualization. Hardware virtualization is an important one. Now that, um, <coughs> now that hypervisors and everything like that have become more, um, more ubiquitous, a lot of your servers that you actually have code running on are not physical servers at all, okay? They're, they're virtual machines. And, and while they're running, running, that's fine, you know, and you've got them all patched and everything, and your code is secure and everything like that. But do you have, a, <coughs> do you have mechanisms in place that would actually alert you to the fact that the underlying virtual machine had been changed? You know, somebody has come in and tampered with that virtual machine. So who runs, who runs virtualized servers? Public code and virtualized servers right now, okay? And of those, right, thanks, put your hands down. And of those people who put your hands up, how many of you have a way of knowing if somebody had changed the underlying virtual machine? 
swapped out one virtual machine for another and then loaded your code back on it. Just one. Okay? So there's a security hole for, for a start. All right? Now, I mean, obviously, that, that's, that's quite a sophisticated hack to do, but you know, it's something to think about, you know, mainly because those kind of things could happen by accident if, if for no other reason. You know, not everything that happens to your code is malicious. Um, sometimes, you know, people are just incompetent. You know, everybody makes mistakes. But, you know, it's, it's worth thinking to yourself, you know, if that underlying virtual machine that my code is running on was tampered with, was changed in any way, you know, how would I know? Disaster recovery. Hang up. How long are you back up and running? Now, I love this one. Hands up here has got disaster recovery in place for their servers and everything like that, right? That's most people. If you've got servers, you've got disaster recovery, right? If that's just, it's just a done deal. Everybody knows that stuff now. It's like, yes, we have to have disaster recovery. <clears throat> Who's tested that disaster recovery plan? Few people. Not as many, but a few people. How many of them failed the first time testing them? Most of them, right? And that's why, that's why you test them, right? I guarantee, the, the, the trouble is, we, we, used to say, we used to say this all the time, right? So I'm, I'm a fan of Scottish rugby, and Scottish rugby isn't that great, and hasn't been for a, for a few years, right? And then every, at the start of the Six Nations Championships, you know, we all get full of hope, and we sit down, me and my mates in the pub, and we go, do you know what? On paper, we've got a really strong team this year. Unfortunately, the game isn't played on paper, it's played on grass, right? And that's where we get our arses kicked, right? It's the same here, right? On paper, your plan for disaster recovery could be awesome, okay? But unfortunately, the plan is never executed on paper. It's executed in a data center somewhere, and stuff just doesn't work for reasons which are sometimes ridiculous and are just unfathomable. Um, and there's no way you could have seen them happen. And so you have to test, and you have to test regularly, okay? There's a brilliant, there's a brilliant um, tale of a local, local hospital um, to, to where I live. They have, not unsurprisingly, like every hospital does, they have a big, a big generator, right? So if the electricity supply goes off, this generator kicks in, right? And supplies electricity for the hospital. And as on the routine maintenance, on a weekly basis, that generator is tested, okay? Every week, and every week without fail, that generator passes, okay? So there comes a time where, as, as will happen from time to time, Local road maintenance guys were outside and they put the shovel of a JCB straight through the electricity cable, right? Cut the power to pretty much a quarter of the time, okay? Including the hospital. Did the generator come on? No, it didn't, right? And so there was a bit of a flap while people went down and sorted it all out and, and got the generator working. And, but there was, a, there was a time lag there. And it was a time lag enough that it scared the management and they said that, what the hell happened there? Bring me the head of maintenance, or, or bring me the head of the maintenance guy. Not really sure which one they meant, right? But they, they took it to mean bring him the head of maintenance. So they brought the head of maintenance, and he had his clay come up with his clipboard. He said, no, look, this has been tested, tested every week, and every week it's passed. And I said, ah, that's fine then. It's not our fault. It's a faulty generator. Call in the supplier. The supplier came in, and he said, checked it all. He says, there's nothing wrong with the generator. I said, there must be, because when we needed it, it didn't start, and it's been tested every week. And the guy said, well, how do you test it? And he said, well, obviously, you know, I, I, I test it by pressing the test button. And I went, all right, show me. So I pressed the test button, the thing starts. The engineer from the supplier went, oh, that's really weird. He says, let's have a look. And basically what it turned out to be was that test button, which starts the generator, draws its power from the national grid just for that test. But when the electricity goes down and the generator has to start, that starting is actually drawn from a battery, which is inside the generator, OK? But during test, that battery is never tested, right? It draws its power from there. And that battery is faulty, all right? But even here pressing the test button doesn't actually test the thing, right? But on paper, somebody's gone, yes, that's fine, yeah, blah, 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 that all works, right? And someone's come along going, boom, for test, that works. It's not until you actually need it, okay? Now, if you're a hospital administrator, I'm not suggesting for one minute that you go to test your stuff, right, by cutting off the supply from my site. I'm just saying that disaster recovery plan needs to be tested and needs to be tested often because just because it worked three months ago, right, doesn't mean to say they, they, um, they'll work now. Those people who put their hands up to say they do have a disaster recovery plan that they, that they test, how often do you test it? Twice a year. Twice a year. Yep. Is that about, but anybody just do it like once and go, yeah, we've done that and we'll never go back to it. 
No. Okay. So it kind of varies, kind of varies in the in the length that you test it, but nobody nobody goes, does that still covered pan works? Tick, move on. But the thing that we don't do is do a test where somebody just goes in and cuts the cable and that's everything, you know, the, cuts the cable for the power. Mm -hmm. We shut everything down in a controlled way, fail over to another data center and see if we can start up again, and of course it's a real disaster. That's not how they work. So yeah, that's, that's not how a disaster works. Yeah, yeah the clues in the name, disaster. Yes. So, so we've never tested, and I mean, I don't yeah. know anyone who would be brave enough to do that, because I'm sure it would not. No, and to be fair, I'm not, I'm <coughs> not really aware of any data center that would allow you to come in and, and take a cabinet and just pull the plug yes. out the back and see what happens. Because yeah. I'll tell you what happens, bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Bad stuff will happen. <coughs> Data transmission security. Who's listening in? Yeah, M man in the middle attacks and stuff like that. You know, your your data center can be secure as you like, and your data can be secure as you like, and you you could have the authorization stuff done, and you can have the authentication stuff done, and that's all good. But there comes a point where you're happy with the client that you actually have to send data down the wire. Okay. And we all know how we solve that problem, right? HTTPS and all, all the rest of that, okay? Who does that kind of stuff? Who's looked and said, what data is getting sent down there and is it secure? Yeah. If I feel the need to secure it in my data center and secure it in the database, do, do your designs actually follow that pattern through and say, well, okay, this data, which has to be super secure here, also has to be super secure in flight. Who looks at security in flight? Okay, hands down. Well, quite a lot of people. Let's ask it the other way. Who's got data that they felt had to be secured in the database but doesn't secure it in flight? Hasn't thought about that? But nobody's going to put their hands up now because oh, no, you'll laugh at me. You'll call me bad. Okay, good. Nobody then. Okay, so <clears throat> those are all things that you have to think about regardless of what data stores that you're using. Even if you've just got the single RDBMS <coughs> database, you know, the old um, square, square, cylinder um, type. Um, architecture. Can I do something for you? Absolutely, just jump out anytime. When you're going off site, sometimes you have a situation where your development team is distributed, so you go up to Ukraine and India, mm -hmm. and uh, which you spoke about yesterday in your workshop, which was excellent. How, how do you deal with anonymizing data during development? So you can use it in the cloud, but in production, you're going to use it local. With you compliance reasons, you need to have all your data local. So have you, have you dealt with that situation where you need, you only need your data off-site for the development phase, but you need to anonymize your test data because of privacy issues? Okay, I don't think I completely understand your question, but I think what you're saying is how do you, how do you take data, anonymize it, and use that for development? Is that what you're saying? So that you're, so basically what you're saying is how do you ensure you've got data of the right shape but it's completely anonymous when you're developing? That's your question. Okay, so actually I cheat, right? I use for, um, especially for, for RDBMSs, I use a tool by Redgate, right, which will actually generate test data. So what we do, um, what we do is we create that schema, right, and we have that, we have that plan um, and, all, and the schema, and then once you've got the schema, basically there's just this Redgate tool where you point it at that schema and you say, please fill that schema with 100,000 rows in each of the tables. Okay, and it, it takes care of um, all of the foreign keys and everything like that. Now, when you are using other data stores, okay, the, the, the tooling for the other data stores is, is obviously farther behind than RDBMSs because RDBMSs have been around since the 70s. Okay, so they've got a big jump. So those, those don't exist. And, and basically, you've got two choices then. Okay, <clears throat> you can either write your own scripts to generate your data based on the schema that you need, which is completely random, randomized, or you can take live data and actually apply a noise um, algorithm to that. Okay, so you're going to change the names slightly, and you're going to mix the letters around in the names. You're going to take all the names out and just replace them with something else. You're going to change the, the values, but still within the right, and um, you still within kind of the the, the right mins and max and that kind of thing. So you can, you can apply, as I say, like a noisy filter that means that that data um, can't really be, can't be like a one-way hash. No, so you can apply the noise filter, but it can't be reversed back to get the actual data. Um, 
there are faults with both of those things. Neither of those things are perfect yet. Um, but the, the tooling for these things is, is coming. And I suspect in, in, in the future, the same kind of tooling that exists for, um, for RGBMS is where you can just go, here was my schema, please give me 100,000 rows in each of the tables, right? And I want them to be you know, a mix of 80% female names and 20% male names and all that kind of stuff. And those tools will handle all that test data for you. Those tools will be coming in the pipeline for these other um, databases. We just haven't got there yet. There's a, there's a lot more important stuff that we don't have in terms of tooling that needs to be done first. How have you solved that problem um, yourself? We struggle with it. <laughs> it's it's not a solved say, problem let's yet. Let's just go in the cloud and think, well, you understand that this data is going to be a real problem now. We yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Especially that whole thing, like you say, that whole regulatory idea of, you know, you can store that data, but, you know, it's going to be stored. It's not so bad for us in the UK because yeah. the rules tend to be within the EU. So that's fine. So certainly if you're in the Microsoft world, both of the data centers are within the EU. So strictly speaking, we're okay. But if we had data that had to be kept in the UK, you know, it would it would rule out, you know, it, it would rule out um, I think both Amazon and um, Microsoft, probably Google as well actually, for terms of you know cloud services. And then you're kind of going, well, who who are we going to get this for? And therefore that's one of those back at the beginning where you get to that stage where you just go, do you know what, the juice isn't working squeeze here. Let's just keep this on print. Okay, so data stores, horses, horses for courses. Okay, so we want to pick the data store. We want to get this right. And actually the principle is really simple. The principle is just, we pick the data store based on the data. We don't pick a data store based on the fact that it's the sexy new thing and try to ram our data in there. Okay, there's a lot of developers saying, oh really, we can't do that? Because I do that all the time. <laughs> What's the latest great technology I want to learn? Okay, there's a few people smiling when they'll never do that. When you're choosing your uh, data store, you want to choose the data store based on the data and the support that that data store gives you for what it is that you want to do. So let's have a look at a few of them now. So we're going to quickly go through this one because we should all really know this one. Right, so relational databases. Use them if the following is important to you. The data and how it's related. Okay, a lot of people forget that part. That's one of the benefits of a relational database. Okay, so not only when the data is important, but how that data is related together, <coughs> if that's important to you as well, then the, an RDBMS is, is the one for you. Obviously, because of normalization, we've got reduced storage costs. There's faster transmission because there's less replicated data. And of course, we've got guaranteed integrity. And we pretty much all know um, the kind of reasons for using RDBMS. So if all of these stuff is important to you, regardless of the data that you're actually kind of um, storing, then you want to be seriously considering um, RB, uh, an RDBMS. So some of the best practices, and this is, as I said before, this is not, this one slide for a start, so you can't, yes, sir? Would you lump in tools for consideration for using Yeah, so that's absolutely correct. That's a great question. The question is, you know, do, do, should tooling play a part in your decision as well? And, and the answer to that question is, is absolutely it should. You know, um, data storage is only a small part of the story, okay? And what you want to do with that data is, um, is important as well. So from the point of view here where we are talking about storing data and then we are going to be writing the applications that are going to be accessing that data, Tooling from that point of view isn't necessarily so important because we're writing the tooling. We, we don't want to store the data and then use a tool on it. We want to store the data for use in our application. And so we're the ones writing the application and therefore it plays less of, of a role there because you know we want to use the data storage which is best for our application needs. But if you're planning to do something else with that data, like purely reporting, for example, reporting is a good um, example, where the, tool, the reporting tooling for RDBMS is, is way ahead of the reporting tooling for document storage and um, data stores, for example. And so if that's what you want to do, if you just store for reporting, then you know, absolutely you should be thinking along the lines of, well, you know, storage, in terms of reporting, storage is, is, is a very small part of the story. And so if the tooling isn't available for what you want to do, absolutely. It should um, form part of your part of your decision, but mainly, especially for the purposes of this talk, we're talking dev stuff. Then we're actually we're writing that code that's going to be accessing the, the data. So here, not for this particular example, not so much. 
Okay, a few best practices, and um, see so if we can get some comments out of this. Um, consistent naming convention, right? There are a few, drives me insane, right? Consistent naming convention, okay? You wouldn't think that was hard, right? It's, but, you know, and, but they say, you know, that there's, um, there's, three, there's three problems in computing, okay? Naming stuff and off by one hours, okay? Those are the three problems in computing. And it's absolutely true, right? People just cannot stick to a naming convention. Um, it's unbelievable. So I'm going to say that, knowing full well, everybody's sitting here going, yeah, well, I'm not going to do that, right? But at least you know that it's bad. You know, at least when you're writing it down, you go, what is the naming convention for this? I don't really care. I'm just going to call it this. That you'll know that mm, I shouldn't really be doing that. But it's Friday and I need a beer. We should use meaningful names, okay? There's nothing worse than... Um, there's two problems with that. There's nothing worse than using something that's only meaningful to you, okay? And there's also nothing worse than a name that was meaningful three months ago, and now that you have worked in that area, you come back to it, and you go, I have no idea what that table does, okay? Or what it holds, more importantly, okay? This should be singular, not plural. Who has plurals in their database names? Who has S? Don't do that, right? <clears throat> okay? Avoid prefixes and suffixes is one of the things that drives me insane, right? I know it's a table because, you know what, it's a table, right? Calling it TBL something does not help me at all, okay? In fact, it makes my life hard because there is no alphabetical ordering anymore. So when I open your database and there are 200 tables and I'm looking for customer, I can't look for C because you've called them all TBL something, okay? Don't do that. What, what about uh, foreign key colors? What about what, sorry, say again? Foreign key or primary key colors. In terms of naming them? Yes. Um, so then, then a prefix or suffix actually is quite useful. So if I have a table, you know, staff and in another table, yes, yes. staff FK, yep. makes quite a lot of sense at that moment. It does. And that rule is up here with it, using meaningful name. Yeah. Okay, it's where, so I would, so where people say, aha, no, I'm, I'm talking about table suffix is here, okay? I'm not necessarily talking about column suffixes, and even if I was, you, you're absolutely right. This one, using meaningful names, outweighs everything else as far as I'm okay. concerned, right? If I'm, looking, if I'm looking at a table, and there's four tables in it, and they've got like, there's four columns in them, and they say ID 1, ID 2, ID 3, that doesn't help me, right? I don't know where they point to, okay? You're okay. absolutely right. In that case, suffixes or prefixes are absolutely um, required because it needs to be meaningful. I need to be able to look at that table and know where things are pointing at. Yeah. Yeah. And things like you have a table called user and then called column user ID, user name, blah, blah, blah. That is, drives me nuts. Well. Yes, exactly. Like, why, why repeat user? Because user dot ID. Exactly. There's nothing worse, there's also nothing worse than seeing written down in T-SQL, for example, user dot user name, right? That's crazy. Right? How many times? It's like it's like writing C sharp for the compiler, right? How many times do I have to write person? Right? Person, person equals new person. It's the same thing. It's user dot username. It's I know already, right? Stop doing that. Okay? If it doesn't help, don't do it. Okay? Favorite IDs over GUIDs for primary keys, right? I know this is a big debate, right? Everybody who thinks GUIDs are great is just wrong. It's the end of story, right? It's it's just a ridiculous idea. Right? Makes indexing hell and there's no need for it. People say, ah oh, yes. The only benefit of having a GUID is when you take IDs from lots of things, right, and you are amalgamating them together for reporting, right? You don't have, you know, you don't have clashes of IDs, right? That is a bullshit reason, okay? Because you should then, you should use an ancillary key anyway, okay? Yes, I need something. No, sorry, no, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I agree, uh, but I think very often what you need is, uh, for object or whatever you call this thing in, in a row, you need something like a public identity business key or something like that, mm. you know, that is used outside the table. Yes, I agree. But that shouldn't then be the primary key. Yes. <laughs> That's why I like to split primary yes. key and business key. Yes. Something like that. Yes, you're absolutely right, sir. And, and, and that line then, of course, I just assumed when I was writing that down that, you know, in my head I was talking about primary keys, but I didn't actually specify that. You know, you're absolutely right. At that point, you know, there needs to be a skew or something like that necessarily. For, for business use, but that wouldn't necessarily be the primary key, and GUIDs are, are good for that kind of thing. But yeah, for um, you're absolutely right, for indexing, uh, if you're using the primary key, indexing just becomes a nightmare. Don't, don't do that. 
I did put that one as a bit of a laugh actually because I knew there's like there's roughly usually about 60-40 in the room IDs versus GUIs and as soon as I say don't do that right you can see half at least about half the room kind of bristling with well blah, blah, blah. which I usually end the discussion after about 15 minutes of fighting by going look it's my session <laughs> I'm right end of story what do you think about sequential GUIDs are good. One of the things that's wrong with the GUIDs, you see, is the fact that they're, it's just their length and it's just the size of them and causes overpaging and things like that. Um, sequential GUIDs, it's, it's, it's the same problem. It's a, it's a different. Um, they're different, but it's, it's, it has the same problem, in, in my opinion. But I do, I do realize when it comes to this, you know, there, are, there are various other opinions. <coughs> they're all wrong. So. <coughs> okay. Provide a DB access role, okay? Don't use admin for everything, okay? Make sure you've got that tightened down. This goes back to what we were talking about before, security and authorization at two, um, two course uh, granularization, okay? Going, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we're we'll just admin for this and this raised elevation for that. Think about what you need to happen to a table and think about just creating a role to do that thing. So if that role gets corrupted, all they can do in your database is read that table. If they had authorization and they came in through your application pathway properly, all they could do was read the table. If they actually attack that role and they break that role and they now own that role, all they can do is read from that table. Okay, that's the kind of thing you need to be thinking about. Okay, partition big and rarely use tables with different physical storage. Okay, makes life a lot of things an awful lot more performant, okay? <clears throat> and this one, the number of times I do not see that, right? As far as I'm concerned, that is a must, and unfortunately it's right down the bottom, and those sitting in the back, and especially those sitting around the corner, might not be able to see that. But what it actually says is, implement untrustworthy client, okay? Untrustworthy client means I don't care what checks and balances you put in your application layer, right? I'm gonna check everything that you ask me to put in the database. Okay, I'm gonna check it in, I'm going to have foreign key checks, I'm going to have not null checks. It doesn't matter to me as the DBA if you say in your application you check for null so I don't have to, right? I'm going to implement non-trustworthy client, okay? I, I'm just going to assume that the dev that wrote the application layer is a moron, okay? Because I find if you assume that, you are disappointed less often, okay? Okay, let's move on now to key value stores. This is the kind of most basic um, data store that isn't um, so this is kind of like the, the bottom level of storage. So, they exist as a key value pair then, right? There are no indexes. Now what I mean by no indexes, obviously the key is indexed, but what I mean is you can't index on anything else. You can't index on the actual value. So it's not like having an RDBMS where obviously the primary key is indexed, but you can also um, have an index on surname and you can have an index on um, marital status or whatever, okay? Here, the only way to index that is the key. The key is the only index, doesn't matter what the value is, you can't index on that, all right? No foreign keys, which means you can't say this key value pair is related in any way to that key value pair, okay? None of that. They're used mostly for session data, things like web users, mobile users, gamer sessions, those kind of things where you can go, this ID, this stuff, okay? This session ID, this thing that you want to attach to it, okay? They're also used for, and this is where I use it a lot, for aggregate lookups, okay? I do a lot of predictive analytics, being a data scientist and a big data engineer, I do a lot of predictive analytics. And if you're using something like, um, excuse me, if you're using something like Bayes rule, where you need the probability of this evidence, so you need two kind of probabilities there. In fact, actually you need, if you're using Bayes rule, Bayes rule you need three probabilities. You need Bayes rule basically says, what's the probability of event A happening given that event B has already happened? Okay, so um, what is the probability of me forgetting my umbrella given the fact it's pouring with rain? Okay, it's usually pretty high, to let you know, all right? So you need three probabilities there. You need, what is the probability of um, it raining on any given day? What's the probability of you forgetting your umbrella on any given day? And what's the probability of those two things, all right? And to stop you having to calculate those things every time, you can aggregate that. So you can pre-calculate all of the probabilities that you need to do for, um, for this work 
and then store those in a, in a key value pair. So you could have, you know, probability for this is, is this floating point number, okay? They are really, it's really good for that kind of thing, okay? It is blindingly fast for obvious reasons because it's basically all loaded in memory normally, okay? And you say, give me the thing there and it immediately goes, there you go, right? Because that's all it's really good for. Who's used key value stores? Who's got a solution with key value store? Which one is you? Do you use Redis by any chance? Yes, that's guaranteed. You know, if you say key value store, people say Redis. Who else is using one? Yes. Remcache. Remcache, yeah, that's another good one. <coughs> what do you use it for, sir? Um, it's caching and it's the DHCD list statement. Mm-hmm. The all of us. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like it's it's kind of like you know session stuff where yeah. we're holding we're holding DNS leases. And what about yourself? Yeah, it's usually session data. Yeah, session data. Yeah, it's absolutely excellent for that. You know, compared to sticking that in an RDBMS, this is an absolute um, godsend for that kind of thing. Much much faster. The idea is if we lose the entire key store, that's why. Exactly. So what? So yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Shit, <laughs> yeah, they'll be pissed, but they'll log back in. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Good stuff. So let's have a look at a few of the best practices for key value stores then. Okay, so one is cloud servers. If you've got, you know, if you're using cloud services, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, this kind of thing, okay, they tend to have low I.O. capability. And that's important because guess what? You're doing a lot of, not necessarily writing, sometimes you are, but you're doing an awful lot of reading, okay? And so what you want to do there is favor small amounts of, you know, key value instead of big key values, you know, you know, break them down so you're doing lots of little reads as opposed to long reads. Spend time modeling your business as a set of key value pairs. It's hard to do for architecture are used to the relational world, okay? It's fine if you just do the obvious stuff, as I say, like session data, and that's why it's got that niche for session data, because that's like a nobody, right? It's just like this ID, this session information, okay? But if you want to extend kind of outside of that normal usage, okay, it's very difficult for architects to kind of sit down and model their business as a, well, here's a customer and an order. You know, here's an order header and a line item. You know, or here's a, cust here's a customer and the total value of his orders. Okay, that kind of stuff. Um, aggregates are easier. Aggregates are easier to, th to, to think about, as I said before, when it's used for aggregates. So if you go customer and the total value of their order or or um, this particular SKU and the sum total that we've sold this quarter. That's an, that's an obvious one. Um, not quite as obvious as session data, but it's a bit slightly more obvious. So, so kind of when you're using key value pairs, they usually go, you know, session data and then aggregated data, and then you they start to extend it that way. But you kind of they tail off very, very quickly for people who are using them outside of, of those realms. Just because this is hard, because it's not taught, really. And it's not, it's not when I say natural, it's not the way we've been brought up to do it. Okay, so it's, it's, it, it requires a change in thought. Model your access patterns too, because this is important, all right? So don't just model the data, model how you're going to be accessing those key value pairs. The next thing up from key value pairs is um, column family data store. Oh, yes, there's questions. One, there's one question on the previous slide. Uh, does any of these solutions <coughs> Sorry, hang on, I can't, I can't, I'm going to come out of the box, oh no. <laughs> there we go. Any of those solutions then support something like a isolation, can you actually write and read at the same time? So if you want okay. to update them, but you don't necessarily need to lose access to it when you yeah. update it. Yeah, 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 com yeah completely. There, there are, so the question there was, you know, can we use them in, in, in isolation so that reads can carry on happening while writes are happening at the same time? And the answer to that question is, um, it is supported in it is supported in a few of the key value stores that, that I know. If that I mean the thing is there's a plethora of key value storage out there. I'm pretty sure off the top of my head Redis does that. The people who are using Redis, just remind me that's true for Redis, is it? You can do Redis works the process, so it can write the test and serve it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's why I thought. So Redis is one, um, as the gentleman said, which forks a process and that way you can read and write at the same time in, in, in isolation. So that's at least one. Yes, sir. Do, do they also, I don't know much about them, do they provide all the sort of security capabilities that you get with a database? Like, you know, your session data is private. And you need yeah, absolutely. So the question there is, you know, how, how secure are these things? You know, are they as, as secure as um, RDBMSs? And that's an interesting question. So the, so the first question, the simplest answer is yes, they are secure. 
in terms of actual, you know, is your data secure? In terms of security, in terms of integrity, you obviously don't get the same integrity checks um, as you do with an RDBMS, but then you don't need them because you can't do the things that you can do. So for example, um, for integrity, an RDBMS will check a foreign key constraints and stuff like that. Well, you can't have foreign keys and key value store. So although those integrity checks aren't there, it's because that functionality isn't there. So it is secure for what it does, okay? But it's a very niche thing, and as I say, it's good for what it's good at. The good rule of thumb is, if you're finding it difficult to use a key value store to do what it is that you're trying to do, the chances are you're using the wrong data store. It's, you know, it's a bit like going to the doctor and say, Dr. Hurts, when I do this, and the doctor says, stop doing that then. Okay, it's, it's the same thing. If you find you're using a data store, and it's a real struggle, you know, and it's fighting, except for Oracle, obviously, because it will just fight you always. Right? But apart from that, okay, if you are using if you're using a data store and you find that it's fighting you, what you're trying to do is hard, it's a good indication that you're trying to do the wrong thing with that data store. Yes, sir. You, you, you talked about using it for aggregate stuff. Yes. But then some of the things like consistency comes into play. You know, if you have aggregated things, I mean, you know, if you go back to the raw data or the, the original data, then uh, you know you have consistency. But that maybe it's not a big problem for you in those cases. Uh, so exactly. So the, so the question is, well, what, what about, if you're using aggregates, you know, what, what about consistency? And, and by that, I think, I, I take it you mean volatility. You know, what happens if the underlying data is changed so the aggregate is now out of date? Yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of probability, we're always looking in the past. And so the past isn't necessarily going to change, but what it, it is is tomorrow the past will be different from today. Okay. And so you have you always have to for that kind of aggregate, you always you always have to know what the volatility is. You know, it's a bit like setting the time to live for a cash. You know, it's it's the same thing. How long is this cash going to be valid for? How long is this aggregate going to be um, valid for? Do I have to recalculate it every morning on startup? You know, is every time the is every time the application start starts is that good enough? You know, if we're talking about sales in 2006, then that isn't going to change because that was year 2006. That's done and dusted, right? If we're talking sales year to date, right? Next month, it's going to be different from this month because we're doing year to date. And then you, you change it monthly. Absolutely. Yeah. So you do have to pay attention to volatility as well when you're talking about aggregates. But yeah. usually that's a rather low compared to um, your, let's say, your development time scale. Completely, yes. You know, I mean, if I, if I need to update it once a week, I'll once a week, I don't map my stale for a week. Yes, yeah. exactly. And also, of course, it's context sensitive. It depends what business that, that you work in. For the kind of stuff that I'm doing for predictive analytics, um, volatility of the aggregates in a key value store has never been an issue. Um, nothing really changes that fast. It's pretty much it's pretty much difficult to predict something that's changing that fast. You know, if it needs to be updated more than like three or four times a minute, you know, you're thinking, well, really, is my prediction going to help? <laughs> You know, I will make a prediction if you act on it in the next 20 seconds, you're golden, right? But after that, all bets are off. So yes, sir. If you've got um, an aggregate in one of these stores, is there some way of knowing how recently it was updated? So if you've got like monthly sales to date or something, can you look at the something about that and know that it was last updated yesterday? Or do you have to build that into your application? Great question. So the question is basically, do you know basically when that data, how fresh that data is? Okay, so there are, two, there are two answers to that question. The first question is, if we're using this data store, okay, it's on you, okay? So you can, the value could be a tuple, where one item in the tuple is the value and the other item is the timestamp, okay? But that's a brilliant question because it totally just leads on to this, all right? And I'll show you why it's a good um, segue into this in a second. So the next step up is the is the column family data store. Okay. So the column family data store is the next step up for key value. It's very similar to key value store. It consists of a tuple of a key and a value, just exactly the same as a key value store, except this time, the key is guess what the key. Okay. So that hasn't changed, but actually the value this time is a column family of data. Right. So when I say column family of data, you just think table. Right. That's a table to you, okay? And it isn't actually, because what it, what it actually is is a sort of map, all right? But that doesn't really matter, right? It's a table as far as we're concerned. It's, it's columns and, and rows, okay? Each column, and here we go, each column inside the key value, inside the column family, each column is a triplet of name, column name, the value, and a timestamp, 
So this answers your question. If you need to know how fresh your data is, then you're probably going to be using the common column family data store, and you're going to take advantage of the fact that um, out of the box, the column is going to give you the ability to name that column to actually attach a value to it and automatically there will be a timestamp on it, which you can query and you can find out how fresh your data is. These things are good for just the same because they're the next step up from key value. They're pretty much good for the same thing. So fast read writes. And they're like key value, but they allow you to attach more data. Okay. Um, they're very good um, for being highly distributed and they're very good for sparse data as well. The guys at the back there who are straining to see the, the bottom of the um, slides, don't worry about it, I'm going to tell you what's on the slides and the slides are available off the, um, off the application. Okay, so you can get the slides, um, you can get the slides later on um, and I'm, I promise I will read it out, you know, I'll read that information. I won't like just keep that from you, just the guys at the front here will know, shh, I'm going to read it here, right? We'll keep this bit a secret. <clears throat> okay, so some best practices then for um, um, column family. Don't think of it as a relational model, okay? Because even though I just said think table, okay? I said it was a table just to give you that idea, but actually what it is is a sorted map, okay? Now, another thing is the column name size is usually is restricted, so don't store descriptions, okay? After me saying before, you have to draw a line between naming the thing meaningfully, right, and just using lots of flowery language, okay, so that you run out of um, key space, all right? So you need to try to name it sensibly, but actually don't, st don't store descriptions. Don't try to store values in the, in the key and um, part of the key value store. Column values, on the other hand, are normally much larger, usually depending on the flavor of um, column family store that you're using. <clears throat> the values are normally around about two gigabytes, okay? But be careful here because most of the server implementations don't actually implement streaming, okay? So you will start to um, inhibit the speed of your fetches if you're trying to bring back, you know, two or three gigabytes. Also, when you're thinking about row keys, Right? Try to think about a key that can be sharded. Does everybody understand? When I say sharded, does everybody know what I mean? No, okay, so there's a few people shaking their heads. All right, so what I actually mean is um, sharding is a technique for horizontal scaling. Okay, so we've got vertical scaling where you just go, my server is running too slow. Excellent, we'll put more RAM in it and we'll put a faster chip in it. Okay, that can only go so far because once that server is full of RAM and it's got the fastest chip you've got, you aren't scaling vertically anymore. Thereafter, you've got to scale horizontally. So horizontal scaling is more cheap servers. Okay? Sharding is when you say, I've got the server, and it's not going fast enough. I'm going to buy another server, and let's say on this, on, in this table, I've got customers A through Z. Okay? I'm going to leave A through M on this server, and I'm going to put N through Z on the other server. So now the server only has to deal with half the data. Okay? And if that still isn't fast enough, I'm going to do another binary chop. And I'm just going to keep going, doing those binary chops, until my application is fast enough. Okay? That process is called sharding, where you do a binary chop and split the data between two servers. Okay? Which means what you want to do is to pick a row key at design time that will enable sharding. Okay? So if you pick um, the date, for example, DDMMYYY, that isn't a shardable key. Okay, there's no way that I can no way that I can shard on that. But if I pick down here, <coughs> um, if I pick um, the date again and then a bar and then customer ID, I can shard that because I can shard on the customer ID. Okay. So when you're giving when you're giving the the rule key when you're naming your rule keys, always think to yourself, is this shardable? Or if it's not, what do I have to do to make it shardable? And then add that extra part. Again, model your column families around your query patterns because they're a sorted map. So your columns are going to appear in alphabetical order, basically. Okay, it's, and so the ones you want the ones, and um, so, so when you're naming your columns and which columns you're going to have in each of the column families, again, you have to model the query patterns as well as just modeling your actual domain. Sorry, oh, question. Yes. Um, what server implementations would you get for that, that pattern of data store? I mean, we talked about Redis and Memcache with key value pairs. 
And yeah, so there's things like um, Google's Big Table and um, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's things in that nature. Um, table stores, um, Big Table, I'm trying to think of any. Oh, the Cassandra's another one. Yes, excellent. Cassandra. In fact, Cassandra's the canonical example. I don't know why I didn't come off with that one on the top of my head. Cassandra's the canonical example for that. Yeah. Good man. Okay, <clears throat> we need to pick up the pace a little bit and cut down the beyond a little bit of the chat. We're not going to get to the end because it's half past 12 already and we don't want other people eating our lunch, right? So, document store is the next time. This is the next one up. Again, so we're kind of taking up a progression. The next one up from column family storage. What we've got here is um, the document store really stores aggregates. Okay, so it's got aggregates joined together. Okay, so composite data. So for example, the customer, a customer, all that customer's orders, all those orders, order items. Okay, all joined together. Okay, easy way to think about this is a denormalized database. Okay, so like a reporting database. What that normally means as well is you get a lot of repeated data, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, because what you're looking for is you're looking for speed. And basically what you've done there is you've removed the joins. So you're taking the advantage of, of no joins, okay, over storage. Because these days, when RDBMS came around and the whole idea of normalization is because storage was expensive and people were used to waiting on computers to do stuff anyway. Nowadays, storage is cheap, okay, so we don't need to worry about that normalization kind of stuff now. So here, the document store will store aggregates of data. And we're, we can live with the fact that the, the data is repeated a lot Okay, because obviously, for every order, you're going to store the customer again and again and again and again. Okay, but that's no problem because at the minute storage is cheap. Okay, it's really good for semi-structured data. Does anybody? Does everybody here know what semi-structured data is? Does anybody need me to explain that? Okay, the canonical example for semi-structured data is a uh, is a tweet from Twitter. Okay, if you ask the API to give you a tweet, okay, and you go to the API and look up the documentation, it says. If you're, if you're looking at a, a, a relational database, okay, you'll have a row, you'll have a number of columns which describe that row, and if there's no data available for a particular column, you'll have a null in there. Okay. If you select that row, okay, you'll get first name, second name, date of birth, null for this one, null for that one, address line one, address line two, you'll get all of that. In semi-structured data, that, that concept of that row and all of those attributes still exist. But if the attribute is missing, it won't be in your result set. Okay, so you can't just iterate through and say, oh, give me the third one, right? Because the third one will be different every time. And the canonical example for that is a tweet. So there's lots of things that come with the tweet, not just the text. You know, there's the, there's the person who sent it and everybody who followed. And um, the canonical example of the ones that are not there all the time are um, geolocation. If you've got geolocation turned on so that your tweets automatically tell people where you are, if I ask for your tweet, I will get that um, geolocation code, right? If you've got it turned off, then it will just be missing. So I can't say, give me the fourth one and expect that to be. That's semi-structured. So there is a structure to it, but you can't guarantee that you're going to get it every time. Another yes. example would be like a, an RT. Yes, exactly. So another example is the, is, is the RT. You know, if your tweet has been retweeted by somebody else, that value is there. If it hasn't been retweeted by somebody else, it's just missing. Okay? So you have to check every time it's there. So that's what semi-structured is. It's going to be, you're going to get a subset of this set of attributes back. Document store best practices. Durability is generally through replication, okay? So don't want a standalone document server, okay? Because that's not gonna help, right? You're gonna lose durability. Use replica sets for high availability through automatic failover, okay? Storage engines often use Right, memory mapped files for performance. That's how you know. That's how it gets around the performance um, issues of, of gathering all that data. Okay, so if your particular implementation, so MongoDB is one of these examples. MongoDB is an implementation that uses memory mapped files. Okay, so prefer. Um, I've got that one the wrong way. Oh my god! I can't believe I've read these slides so many times, and it's only now in front of an audience where I read it out. I go, that's just stupid. Prefer 32 bit over 64. Never do that. Right, that should be the other way around prefer 64-bit operating systems over 32-bit operating systems, okay, because they're using these memory map files for performance, okay. Those of you who are going to download the slides later, you can point and laugh and show it on Twitter and go, look, Gary the Moron, all right. If your store supports write-ahead journaling, turn it on, for goodness sake, right, the number of people who have write-ahead journaling and have it turned off, okay, this will greatly help you on crash recovery and node durability, okay. So write-ahead journaling is basically saying, this is what I'm going to do, then it does it. Okay? And that enables you to recover from a crash um, 
uh, a lot easier. Keep your working sets plus the indexes, people often forget that, the working sets plus the indexes to a size that fits in RAM. All right? Then everything will be much more performant. A good um, indicator that um, your working set is getting too big is when you start to see page faults. As the number of page faults go up, that's a good indication to you that you need to either increase the amount of RAM in the box or do something about your working set. Okay? And don't shard without a good understanding of your data access patterns. Okay? Choosing a good sharding key here as well is, you know, um, it's all very well sharding if you think you've solved your problem by just a, a straight binary chop, but if 90% of the work is still going to that first shard, you haven't solved the problem. Okay? So you really need to understand what your access pattern is before you decide on how you're going to shard. Blob storage, my favourite. Blob storage, what the hell's a blob? Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question about oh. the document storage? Yes, yes. Oh, I so, searching? Yes. Who XML document store, which is great normally, but if there's a problem, yep. you have to find where the problem was, find me all documents where, and yep. nightmare. Is, um, is, yeah, we just use Solar, but is there any other techniques for speeding up search across documents? So, I'm not entirely sure about that particular implementation, but I do know that there are um, other implementations use MapReduce for um, searching. And that's much easier because then you can split out your um, reduce, yes. You could throw another method in front of it that does the searching for you. And, and, there's, and there's that as well. So very much depends on, you know, I mean, if you've researched your particular implementation and you reckon that solar is the, is, you know, the, the solution to that problem. So it's working now, looking at something, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's a difficult one. And, and the thing is, as well, I, I'm talking in general, I like to see, I mean, when you start to get down to specific issues, it's, it's sometimes just down to the, to the issue with your specific implementation of document stores that you've got. You know, and sometimes it, it may mean moving to another one. I mean, you can, you can go out onto the internet and you can read screeds about people who have moved from MongoDB to CouchDB because CouchDB is much better at this thing and MongoDB sucks, and you'll read just as many people moving from CouchDB to MongoDB because MongoDB is far better. This other thing that CouchDB sucks at. The thing is, you really have to do your research up front you know, to know that the implementation that you're getting is the, the one that's, that's best for you. Unfortunately, it doesn't help you when you're in, you know, when you're up to your ankles in alligators, it's difficult to remember your idea was to drain a swamp is the, uh, is the usual one that goes with that. It's all very well me saying, oh yes, what well, you can do is testing and yada, 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 but it doesn't help you now that you've got that problem. Um, it might be worth it might be worth loading in another um, document database and moving some data over and seeing if you get the same problem. And that might actually be a faster way of fixing the problem than trying to come up with a solution on that implementation. As I say, you should never be right. I said at the start, you should never be afraid to, to throw away stuff that is using the, the new kind of data stores because the the um, the environment is changing so fast. You know, what works, what's really painful today will be really easy tomorrow, and and vice versa. You know. Um, you shouldn't, when you're using new, these new data stores, you know, write tables of, tablets of stone kind of thing. Say, we're, we are committed to MongoDB to the death, you know, because pretty much the death will be next Tuesday if you say that kind of stuff. You know, you have to be prepared to be a bit flexible. Okay, we have to start moving now. <coughs> All right, blob storage, my favorites. Okay, so blobs, guess what? They're used for storing blobs. They used to be called binary large objects. Right? And then when people started shoving other stuff on them, they thought, ah, damn it, it works with other things, so we better come up with another one. And the other one is for basic large objects, you know, for, for stuff which is text, basically CSV files and that kind of thing. Blob storage is an Azure thing, and it's usually, <coughs> well, it's not only an Azure thing, but talking specifically about Azure here, it's either stored as a page blob, which is optimized for random reads and writes, um, and so it's good for storing things like virtual machine hard drives and that kind of thing, or, it's stored as um, a block blob, which I like. I just like saying that block blob. Right? That's, that sounds really good. But um, what this means is it's, ups, it's um, uploaded and stored as a series of blocks and then committed as one file, which means you can get parallel uploading. Okay. <coughs> which is obviously good for upload times and throughputs. Although you do have a maximum size of two hundred gigabytes, right? Which is enough for most people. It can have metadata attached, which is awesome. So you can attach metadata. It's it's all right if you're looking at CSV files necessarily. That's not that's not necessarily. But if you if you're attached if your if your blob is an image, it's great to be able to attach metadata to that image, which actually has information about the image um, on it. Okay, best practices for blob storage. All right, 
Always define the content type of your blogs because this allows the client to correctly handle the content being sent, right? If the content type of your blog isn't known and I pull it down, I'm not going to know whether it's an image or whether it's a video or whether it's a binary shape file, okay? Define the cache control header. This allows the cache to be placed at the client side and reduces reads, okay? If a client just downloaded a big blob, right, and they've already got it, right, there's no need to download it again, all right? Set that cache so that it's on the client side so you don't have to pull it out of blob storage again. Always upload on the parallel, okay? As I said, you can block these stuff. Both paging and block uh, allows you to parallel upload stuff, all right? Don't do it in a single stream. It'll be much faster if you break that up. Choose the right blob. I told you there was two, block and page. Good rule of thumb, although it's not, it's not absolutely constant, but a good rule of thumb is block if you want to stream something and page it if you, and use page if you want to write extensively to it. Okay, so um, virtual machine hard drives is the canonical example because actually that's why Microsoft in, invented that for having their um, virtual machine hard drive. So that's obviously the canonical example. So choose the right, choose the right one. Um, <clears throat> If you just need the metadata, then just read that. If, you're, if you've got an image and you've got a metadata attached to the image, okay, and all you want to know is like when the image was taken and what area it is, don't download the damn image, right? Just download the metadata and read that. And then also turn on CDN for better availability. So it does. Do you know, if I've had a pound for every time I've written that, right? I've written that in code as well, right? And then wondered why you get the squiggly underline. No? It's blog storage, not blog. You can store your blogs in here if you want, okay? But blog storage, that is, did I get it right everywhere else? See once, see once you've got muscle memory. Once you've got muscle memory into writing blog <coughs> instead of blog, that's it, right? You'll get it wrong every time. Not every time, but enough times just to make it look silly. Right, I've got it right there, look. <coughs> okay, so key storage here. They are for storing messages for consumption by other clients, where messages is basically, tends to be around about a 64 kilobyte, 64 megabyte, sorry, lump of stuff, lump of text, okay? There is often a message size limit, not always, not in every implementation, but often there is a message size limit, okay? And they also, some of them often have a time to live limit as well, okay? If you put this message on the queue and you don't do something with it within seven days, it's gone anyway. All right. Not all of them do, some of them do. Pay attention to these two things if they're important to you when you're choosing your queue storage. Okay, those two things are important. Find out what they are for yours because not all of them have them, right? But the last thing you want to do is to start dumping messages onto something and have them rejected because they're too big. Also, what you don't want is long running processes disappearing off your queue because you've exceeded the time to live. These things tend to be durable and persistent. Durable as in you pull you have a client, you pull a message off. If that client dies before it's finished, before it tells the queue that it actually was finished with it, then the queue will then mark that message as available for somebody else again, okay? Persistent as in, the information inside the queue is written to disk so that if the queue server goes down, when you start it back up again, it can read the information off the list, off the disk, and can carry on with the queue as it was before, okay? Durable means the client has to say it's finished with it. You have to take the message off, you have to deal with it, and then you have to come back, report back to the queue to say, I'm done with that message, and the queue marks that message as being done. If you die beforehand, it comes back to life. Best practices for queue storage. Elastically grow and shrink to keep the queue throughput even, okay? What I'm talking about there, he says, realizing that doesn't make any sense. What I'm talking about there is clients. Okay, so you want to elastically grow and shrink the clients that are consuming that queue just to keep the throughput even, okay? Don't hold on to messages longer than you have to. If you're the client, you pull a message off, okay, deal with it, and then report back to the queue server. Because as the, as the writer of a client, you don't necessarily know what the time to live on the durability side of things has been set by the admin, okay? And if you're holding on to that message for and too long, it's possible that the queue might say, well, just assume that client has died and I'll reissue that message. And then what you get is that's when you start to hope that your tasks are, are um, on the, on the, what's that the word? What's that mathematical word? Important. Important, that's the one where you can do the same thing over and over again and get the same result, okay? 
Because if they're not, the second time that message gets processed is really going to mess up your database, right? And those are hard bugs to find, you know, because they don't happen all the time. They're hard bugs to track down. So don't hold on to the message any longer than you absolutely have to. If the message is too large, so you are stuck with a queue server which has that message limit, then what you're going to do is to overflow to a larger storage. I've done it again, e.g. blog storage. Okay, what you want to do there is you want to take this. So let's say I want to put a two gigabyte image onto, um, uh, onto a queue. That isn't going to work. Okay, it's not going to work at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that image in blob storage and then I'm going to put a small message onto the queue that actually points to the location in blob storage where that thing is. That's how we get around that. Test the persistence and durability, right? Don't just, don't just assume it works, certainly. And also, also test that the time it takes you to process a message is with inside the time limit for the queue server for durability. Otherwise, it'll start marking you as dead just because you've taken too long, right? I'm a bit like that. People start marking me as dead because I haven't replied to email at enough time. <clears throat> okay, and once we've done that, right? Yes? Can we keep this to the? Can we keep that question to the end? It's just that we are running out of time now because I mean it's it's good to engage obviously, but I do want to get to the end of it. Um, so what we want to do is we want to lock that stuff up and write and hide it away. All right, there are two things in the world that you don't want people to see how it's made. Right, software and sausages. Okay, if you have all of these heterogeneous data sources in your back end, right, that sounds kind of painful, but you know what I mean. All right, you want that abstracted away and hidden away. Okay, because that is. It's, that's fugly, there's no getting away from it, okay? It's, it's not good and you want to hide that from your clients, all right? So lock that stuff up and hide it away. So here's, a, here's an example architecture for heterogeneous data stores, okay? Here's the, and this is actually the architecture that I've used on the project that I'm now not gonna have time to tell you about, but it doesn't really matter because it doesn't really have an impact on this, it's just an example of where I've, where I've used it, I've actually told you the content of the of the um, session now, but these are the data stores that we've got. So we've got our DBMS, um, and here we normally keep our um, customer data. Surprise, surprise, okay? Here we've got a document store for, um, we've got a document store for things like um, application maps. That's basically how fertilizer is applied to fields and things like that. Key value stores we use for aggregations. Queues um, we use for um, worked up queues and things like, um, the European Space Agency send us satellite images and what happens is they drop them in a queue to be processed, okay? And then they ping us on our, they ping us on our service bus to say, by the way, there's something waiting for you and we go and have a look. Again, they don't drop the image on the queue because it's freaking huge, all right? They put it in blob storage and drop, just like I said, they drop a small message onto the queue that actually says where the image is. And blob storage, guess what? That's where all the satellite images go. Then what we do is we hide that away from people, right? So we have a data access API here, a kind of private internal API here that nobody really sees except for our services, but it hides all of this, it abstracts all of this stuff away, okay? And I end up writing all this horrible um, code in here, but all the other developers are happy because they just call nice services um, and all this stuff is abstracted and hidden from them. Then we have our service bus, okay, where all the messages are put on. Um, and the service bus obviously talks to the data layer, which queries this, which drops messages back onto the kind of um, public service bus. And then we have all of our clients down here. Okay, so our mobile clients, web clients, REST APIs, and all the rest of it communicate by dropping, by communicating with services on the service bus. The services in the service bus talk to my data access API, and that comes out of there. But this part here basically ensures that all this untidiness basically it ensures that I can use the data stores which are best used for the data that I'm trying to store but the fact that I've done that is totally abstracted away from this layer here as far as, the, as they're concerned this could be anything up here okay developers like that a lot better than having to learn all about all these individual nasty things that Gary's brought into the dev team okay we do not have time to talk about the case study. It's, uh, yeah, do you know what we could, we could flash through it a little bit just to kind of let you understand where we, where we actually use this, right? And, and where I've you know, picked up the best practices. And as I say, these best practices are not, industry, because this is not a solved problem, right? This is not the industry saying these are best practices, it's just best practices that, that I've come across. So our case study is, 
I did some work for a, a, a farming company um, up, up in Scotland and they have diversified as a lot of farms had to do because there's very little money in farming. But this guy is, um, he's diversified into agribusiness and actually this idea of optimizing the yields for everything. Okay, we do have a problem um, in the future. Everybody's talking about global warming and all the rest of it. But before we get to global warming, we're gonna have a problem with actually the size of people, the number of people on the planet. Um, the growth of the people, the growth of the population, human population on the planet is exponential. It doubles about every 35 years, okay? So there's seven billion people on the planet now in 35 years time. By the time, you know, your, your children are starting to grow up and have their own children, there'll be 14 billion. And by the time their children are retiring, there'll be 28 billion people on the planet, okay? This is a problem for feeding these people apart from anything else, right? And we're only talking something like 70 years from now, right? That will be a problem long before global warming becomes a problem. Um, and he's looking at ways of, of fixing this by, by actually maximizing the amount of crop yield that you can get out of every acre of ground. So that's what he's diversified into. So one of the things that we, that we do, we talked about before, is this idea of application maps. So what we do is we sample the soil at every 10 meter intervals, and then we use an algorithm to say, well, that 10 meters um, has soil that looks like this. And then what happens is we can create an application map which is fed into a seed drill, okay? And the sophisticated feed drills right now will deploy the optimum amount of seed and the optimum amount of fertilizer for that seed for that 10 meters. And as you're driving down the field with your tractor, the seed drill is going this amount of seed, that amount of fertilizer, that amount of seed, that amount of fertilizer. So every 10 meter square field has the optimum amount of, of seed and fertilizer to get the best yield. Also, you can mix and match the seeds as well. Okay? Not a lot of people like to talk about this, but unfortunately it is the solution, right? Monsanto and all of these kind of people with their, with their genetically modified seeds, right? You can actually say, we should plant this seed here and that seed here, right? And that's going to be part of the solution. Although a lot of people, especially Americans, go, ah, GMO, it's genetically modified, you know? You understand that pretty much everything that we eat is genetically modified, it's just this is a faster way of doing it, right? The cattle that we are eating now have been selectively bred to be like what they are. That's genetically modified, okay? But a lot of people don't understand that. So the data in the stories that I use to do this, okay, we use shapefiles, obviously. Shapefiles are a geolocation thing which basically just describes an area on the ground, and that tells us where the fields are for a start, okay? These are, um, these delimit the field boundaries, and they are binary in format, and we store them in blob storage because they're binary files. Soil samples we take are CSV files, um, and they consist of X, Y, which is a, a longitude and a latitude, and then a number, and then a sum data, okay? So Z1 through N data. So what they say is that this latitude and this longitude, the pH is this, and the potassium is that, but the nitrogen is this, okay? <clears throat> we store these in column family store, okay, for each of these Z values, okay? Because it obviously, it varies because you don't get everything from every soil sample. We also do normalized difference of vegetation index, right? Who's heard of that? No, I had not heard of it until I started coming. This is far as I'm concerned. You, you hear people say that there's nothing to differentiate to an uneducated person. There's nothing that differentiates science from magic. Yeah? Well, this is me. I didn't know about this until I started working with this guy. As far as I'm concerned, this is magic, right? What happens this, what this is, right, is it's a <coughs> geographical indicator. It's used to sense remotely gathered information, normally from a space platform, right? We get, um, we get images from the European Space Agency, okay? And what it does is it indicates the presence, of, the presence and health of green vegetation, okay? So basically what happens, at a low level, green light isn't reflected by plants, right? Because chlorophyll, it absorbs all of the green light. Red, and what's called red shift, is reflected, but it's reflected in a particular way. So if you know the crop and you know the growth, where about in the growth cycle that crop is, you know what the reflective infrared and redshift value should be. So if you fly a satellite over a field and that farmer on that field says, I'm growing corn and I'm on week six of the growth, you know what the reflective IR index and redshift index should be, okay? And you can check it. And if it's not, it's an indication that the, the crop is unhealthy. The benefit of that is that you can detect that in the redshift seven to 10 days before you can actually see it with your eyes. So the farmer walking through his field won't be able to see that that crop isn't thriving, all right? We'll give him a seven to 10 days lead time where he can have that soil analyzed 
and inject into the soil the nutrients that that plant is lacking so that it can catch up, okay? And you can save that part of the field. Data used in storage, satellite images obviously are obviously in binary data and they are freaking ginormous and we put them in stub, in stub blurage. There we go, hey, stub blurage. That's better than blog storage. All right, the reflective light index comes as a CSV file, again, stored in column family um, store. Um, we use it for potato blight prediction. Uh, sorry, potato, potato, potato blight prediction is something else. Potato blight is a fungal infection of potato tubers. It's what caused the great potato famine in Ireland when all the Irish people came across here and they went to America because apparently all they ate was potatoes and when there was no potatoes, they all starved. Um, it was caused by this. All right? It's highly correlated with temperature and humidity. Okay? So if you can sense that, you can pretty much predict where you're going to get potato blight, right? and you can do something about it. It renders crops or part of totally useless. All right? It was the potato famine in Ireland. That's how bad it can be. So what data storage um, do we use for that? Okay? Obviously, we have temperature sensors in the field every 10 to 20 meters. Okay? So we sense that temperature data. We get it in a CSV file stored in a column family store. We use our prediction model, we then read this information and we say, you know, for this temperature, for this humidity in this part of the field, your predicted chance of getting potato blight is this. Okay? We store that prediction model like this, latitude, longitude, prediction, probability, really. So it's a float between zero and one. We put that in the key value store, just like I said, it's perfect for that kind of thing. So the key is latitude and longitude and the value is the prediction. Super fast for pulling that in. <clears throat> okay, so we did get to the end after all, um, and excellent, two minutes, which means I now have two minutes for questions, so you can go. Okay, um, we're talking about Q storage. Yes, I was talking about Q storage, just wait till I flick back there. Okay. When I say wait, I didn't actually mean wait, I say continue speaking whilst I do it. Um, Presumably, in that form, if, you, if you're um, sending to like multiple subscribers or multiple clients, you've got actually got multiple clients. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so the question there was, um, if you're sending to multiple multiple clients, do you have multiple copies of the um, message that you put on the the queue? And answer that question is yes. So, something like Microsoft's um, service bus, the Azure service bus, it can do that. You can put a message on the service bus, and you can say and copy it to these um, other queues. So absolutely, and, yes. Um, are there are there discrete examples of new storage, or do they normally come wrapped up with like MSMP or any other core system? So there are there are. So the question there was, you know, do they come bundled with other stuff like Microsoft's Azure version, or do you get standalone keys? Is that is that your question? Oh, the storage part. <coughs> the storage part of the key. Like I'm not really sure what you mean. Does it come on its own? Um, you've obviously got APIs for clients and subscribers. Yes, because without that, it's not a queue. It's it's just a it's just a bunch of stuff. <laughs> but without those APIs to actually join and take stuff off, it, it's not a queue. Yes, it would be something else then. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. There's no such thing as a stupid question. There's just a, it's, yeah, you just, just need to talk through, and then when you say it out loud, you go, oh, yeah, I see, what, I see what you're saying, it's not a cue then, is it? Yeah. It's like my grandpa always said, yeah, I said, yeah, I always said, yes, but if I did so and so, such and such would have happened, and he always used to come back and said, yes, and if your granny had wheels, she'd be a bike. You know, it's that. Which just, you know, when you're six, you just go, wow, that's amazing. I, I'm done. That's it. I'm off. I can't argue with that. But it's that kind of thing, you know, if it didn't have, it didn't have all of that bells and whistles, it wouldn't be a cue, it would be something else. Probably a bike. Um, any more for any more? Anybody for anything else? No, well, in that it's okay. You can you can stay behind and ask your question. In that case, I will thank you very much. That is a really thank you. That is a really tough presentation to sit through because it really is death by PowerPoint. But unfortunately, there's no other way of doing it for best practice. You just got to whack them up there and and show people. So thanks very much.
Okay, we'll get started then. Um, this talk is best practices for heterogeneous data stores, and unlike all the other talks that I've given this week, there is no code in it whatsoever, I am afraid. Okay? Um, so if you're at my earlier talks that were packed with code for excellent, it'll be more of the same. There isn't any code, unfortunately. Mainly because I'm not able to download all of the databases and data stores that I'm talking about, have them installed on my laptop and have working code to demonstrate them. Alright? So to stop that, to stop this turning into like death by PowerPoint, right? Because it's a best practices talk, so it's just gonna be slide after slide after slide. So to stop it becoming really like death by PowerPoint, as I say. Um, I hope we can get a bit of a discussion going, you know, when I put up the best practices and you guys um, disagree with me, then we can get in a bit of a discussion and that way, um, you know, it'll turn into a bit of a better session. Otherwise, it's gonna be death by PowerPoint. It'll probably last about an hour instead of 90 minutes because we'll just be going through the slides. The benefit of that, of course, is that we'll all get away early for an early lunch and you guys will all be in front of the queue um, when it comes to food. So, you know, participate or don't, it, it's kind of up to you. When I say these are best practices, right, these are not, these are not industry established best practices because, because basically this is not a solved problem. Heterogeneous data stores isn't a solved problem. Things change all of the time. If you're looking at this environment <coughs> and, and this landscape, you know, new things are coming along all of the time. So one of the things um, that that means is that there isn't really a settled um, in most of the areas, there isn't really a settled consensus on what best practice is. So when I actually say best practice, what I mean is it's stuff that I've done when I've been using these things which works. However, best practice, as it turns out, is a better phrase to use in a title for a talk than stuff I've done what worked. Um, so you guys may disagree. Um, and more importantly, I don't necessarily want you to go away and think, well, Gary said it had to be done this way, and so I'm going to stamp my fist and slam my foot on the ground or the other way around um, if I don't get my own way. It's just stuff that it's worked for me and it's really something for you to think about. All right? And then as I said, just to make the talk um, not super boring, at the end I've, I've um, included a use case um, of one of the latest projects I've been working on where we, where we had a set of heterogeneous data stores um, in the solution just because that was, that was the, the best way to go. So I'm going to talk a bit about that at the end as well. So <clears throat> this is me and um, if you're interested. Um, Actually, this slide is not particularly interesting. There's nothing particularly um, important on that. And um, basically it tells you a bit about me and what I do. The only kind of interesting things or important things on that slide are the two bits at the bottom, where if you want to ask me questions or disagree with me, um, but don't want to do it to my face, um, then you can email me or you can get a hold of me on Twitter. Um, as I've said in all of my talks so far, and as I mostly say, if you have a question, you're far more likely to get an answer if you contact me on Twitter. Not because I sit on Twitter all day when I'm supposed to be working, but your question can only be 140 characters long if you ask it on Twitter, okay? And if you ask a question 140 characters all the time, and then when it happens, people go, well, that's ridiculous. You know, it's all this weak credential reset mechanisms, you know? Um, the reset mechanism gets written in the early days and before this whole idea of clear text passwords was a problem, and you never go back and fix it, and yet you know. You know, in fact, not only do you know as a developer it's a bad idea, but when somebody, when you have a reset mechanism and somebody sends your password and clear text to you in an email, you get pissed off about it, right? And then you think, but nobody actually sits down and goes, hmm, I wonder if we do that. What is, what's our um, mechanism? Who here has a password, like an online presence for the company who has that kind of um, reset mechanism? A couple of people. Who's really confident that they don't send passwords and reset mechanism in clear text, right? So about a third of the people who put their hands up to say they have a mechanism put their hands up to say I'm confident that we don't do it that way. Okay. But this is this is one of the one of the most straightforward and leaky mechanisms inside your website for exposure for security is the fact that you send clear text passwords. Right? Not necessarily even because you're sending them in the clear, right? It's because if you're sending them in the clear, pretty much guaranteed you're storing them in the clear as well. Right? And you just pulled that out and sent it on. This is another one, weaker faulty authorization technique, so URL guessing, right? Who's, we've, all, we've all seen these, um, we've all been to the sessions and, and security conferences and stuff like that where guys have demonstrated by just hacking the URL in the web page you can get to, to different places and places that you shouldn't 
be able to get to and say, oh, well, you know, if my account is this, then maybe what's so-and-so's account? And if I do this, I might get that. And this part here is obviously the ID number, so if I just mess around with ID numbers, do I get other people's accounts? Who's seen that kind of thing before? Not only that, who's done that? Who's gone to, like, the BA website or, you know, whatever and gone, oh, I wonder if I could mess around with this? Right? Everybody here with their hands down is lying. <laughs> We've all done that. It's like saying to people, who watches porn on the internet? No, no, no one ever does that. Right? But it's a huge industry, so somebody wants. Right? It's the same with this kind of messing around. You know, stuff which is like, well, that's, that's below developers, surely. Developers, don't. no, they don't. We all sit there and they go, no, I wonder if they can do so and so. You know, it's that, it's that mentality that um, developers have of, mm, I wonder how this works. And especially testers. Testers especially do that because they have a totally different mentality from developers. You know, developers have this kind of mentality of, I wonder what I can build with that, that's really cool, right? Testers have this mentality to say, how can I break that? Right, it's like that little destructive little boy. Inside, inside every tester, right, there's a destructive child, right? You know that they were the person with the broken dollies and the broken cars when they were, like, when they were kids. Oh, yeah, this works. How can I break this? Okay? They're the kind of people who go, oh, what if I can hack about in here? Another one is authorization at two cores of granularity. We see this all the time, admin for everything. You know, you see it on things like the RDBMS um, um, data stores where, you know, the password um, is, is just SA, you know, and then it's admin, admin, okay? See this a lot. Authorization of two cores of granularity, okay? Too high an authorization for everything just to get stuff working. And of course, and once you have given somebody that high authorization, um, they can pretty much do what, whatever, whatever they want. If you give them a high enough authorization and they can get out of the sandbox that you think that they buy, for example, in document data stores, I won't necessarily talk about MongoDB or CouchDB or RavenDB, for example. But it'll be interesting to see when we get to these bits which actual implementations you guys are, uh, you guys are using. So the first thing that we need to talk about before we even talk about what kind of data store we're going to use is this kind of idea of kind of cutting the apron strings there, this kind of on-premises, off-premises kind of thing. And in general, you tend to find that all managers, I mean, I'm talking generally, obviously, your managers generally want to move everything into the cloud because if it isn't cheaper, then the costs are unmanageable. You know what they are up front, okay? You can calculate them. Whereas when you run your own data center, the costs are, to a certain extent, known, but you have no real idea. I mean, you, you understand how much your co-location is gonna cost you, you understand how much um, you have to pay in, in staff costs to run and things like that, but you don't really have any idea with regards to how many hard disk failures you're gonna have, you know, whether you're gonna to have to replace your servers, whether a patching of, this, of um, Microsoft Lakes patch is gonna take out your servers for three days, um, because that never happens. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Whereas, when you move everything into the cloud, it's much more manageable cost, right? It doesn't necessarily matter to managers if it's a little bit more, because more money is not necessarily in, in Important, it's the fact that it's unknown, it's quantifiable. Okay, you know what that cost is going to be. Whereas when you've got your own data centers, it's not necessarily so. So managers tend to generally want to heave everything into the cloud and go, yes, that's fine, we can forget about it. And <coughs> engineers and um, software architects and DBAs especially want to keep everything in house where they can see it, you know, and um, they know all the data is there. And sometimes it's good to have stuff. Um, in the cloud, and sometimes it's just easy to have stuff on premises, okay? Especially if it's things like customer data, okay? Because as soon as you start holding customer data, as soon as you start holding data, which can be, can identify a living individual, you are in the world of data protection, okay? And you have to satisfy the data protection legislation. All right, and it's people whose job that is, you know, to make sure that you are complying. Um, it just gets a little bit more complicated when you say, oh, I put that in the cloud. Well, did you know? Well, where's that? Oh, it's in the cloud. Well, is it still in the EU? Did you put that in? Did you put that in a, in a Azure data center in Dublin, for example? Or is it in continental Europe, which is fine? Or did you put it in the states? You know, are you allowed to move that data? Does your regulatory body allow you to move that data outside of the UK? Are you allowed to move it outside of the UK, but provided you tell somebody about it, you know, fill in the right form in triplicate normally, okay, and then fax it to somebody. So there's all these kind of problems. So, just by a show of hands, who's got who's got data, uh, who's got a data mix on prem and off prem, just now. All right, quite a few people. In your organisations, was was that a hard sell to keep a mix? Did did you feel that some people were wanting to stay 
um, on-prem, some people were wanting to keep it all in the cloud, or was it a pretty obvious split with your data, which way it had to go? Yes, sir. So my experience was kind of the opposite. Um, our management wants to put everything into the cloud, and I'm one of the few people who's standing up and saying, hang on. As long as you're far more likely to get an answer than if you email me seven pages. If you email me seven pages, you will still get an answer, don't get me wrong, but you just might not like it as much. So, best practices for what now? So, when I say heterogeneous data stores, what I mean is using more than one data store in your solution, okay? So, traditionally, you know, you know the, the traditional um, architecture, we can all do traditional architecture in our sleep. You can't actually believe that people get paid money these days for what's called traditional architecture because everybody knows what it is. It's just box, box, cylinder, done. Right? Everybody knows that, right? That's it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what it is you're designing, right? You have a look, and if you drill and if you drill down low enough into the into the um, architecture, it's just box, box, cylinder, finished. Right? I don't I don't know why Visio has any more diagram um, elements than that. That's all, that's all you need. Alright? But that's when the cylinder is your traditional um, RDBMS, okay? But things have moved on now and we have different kinds of data and those data um, are sometimes not particularly well suited to be stored in an RDBMS, all right? But we still have data, pretty much every solution is always going to have data. I mean, if you are an organization and you have customers, okay? Pretty much that is a solved problem. Storage of customers, right? We've been doing that for a while now. That is a solved problem, right? Trust me, DBAs, they, they totally have that one owned, okay? So if you've got a business, you're pretty much going to have some kind of RDBMS there in the background anyway, okay? Simply because there's just so many tools around to help you with that that it would be stupid not to. But then, of course, you've got other data that's come on stream that doesn't really lend itself well to being stored in that RDBMS. And so now we have to find other data stores which are better suited to storing that kind of data and so we've brought them on board as well and so these days we usually have um, solutions which have more than one kind of data store okay and that can give us um, it can give us issues with which data should we store in which one you know just because we've got an RDBMS just, just exactly like when we had an RDBMS and it wasn't suitable for storing everything right we shouldn't just take in another data store like a document data store for example and then basically store everything else in there, okay, because the same thing applies. That's not necessarily the best way to store that data. And so we end up with maybe two or three different kinds of data stores in our solution. And we need a set of best practices, or as I said before, stuff what works um, for me. Um, and some of the issues and decisions that you're gonna have to make when you're, when you're bringing that in, so that's what I mean. So just by a show of hands just now, how many people have worked or are working on a solution right now that's got more than one kind of data store in it? So pretty much most of you, excellent. So we should get some kind of discussion and some kind of um, disagreement when I start saying this is the thing you should do with this, right? And we'll also, just, just because I'm interested and for no real other value, we'll also talk about, you know, when we get there, what kinds of data stores. As we go through the data stores, I'll ask people, um, I'll ask people what, you know, if they're actually using them and, and which flavor. Because I'm gonna talk, um, I am gonna talk generally about a data store. I'm not going to name specific um, versions, for example. So I will talk about You can't necessarily do that because there's all sorts of regulations about individual and um, sort of customer confidentiality and so forth that we need to take into account. If it's in the cloud, you don't know where it is and often you can't do it. So mm -hmm. it was actually trying to kind of rein people in a bit. Yeah, trying to, trying to bring them back. Yeah. Right. But did anybody else have any problems, or was it kind of an, an obvious kind of split as to where the on-prem, off-prem should be going? Our experience is the other way around, is that uh, it's feeling our management that we can securely hold uh, sensitive data in the cloud mm -hmm. is uh, the other challenge. And I'll grant you that is not an easy problem to solve. It, it isn't, actually. The whole idea of security, you know, isn't, isn't an easy thing, you know, trying to convince people, especially... I find as well that, that non-technical people don't really understand the difference between, oh, Dropbox has been hacked, oh, Apple's iCloud has been hacked, and all these naked photographs of celebrities are on, are, you know, on the internet, data security, as opposed to, well, this is in the Microsoft Azure data center in Dublin, right? which I believe has a tanker trap. That fact alone just boggles my mind. 
I mean, who sat down and thought, when we secure this data center, right, we better make sure it has a tank trapped, right? That kind of security, it's very difficult for non-technical people to actually separate that in their heads. They think, you know, because that has happened to Apple's iCloud, that their data in the cloud isn't necessarily as, as secure, you know? As if their data, as if, you know, Joe Bloggs's small, in relative terms, company, right, represents the same kind of target as you know celebrities iCloud's accounts to, to, to hackers and it's very difficult and some people just go no 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 the cloud isn't secure and it's much easier if we keep that data on prem and actually sometimes as as my american friends are um, fond of saying sometimes the juice isn't worth the squeeze in that argument you know it, it doesn't really matter if there are really good technical reasons for moving your um, secure data on-prem into the cloud. Sometimes it's just not worth having that argument. You go, do you know what? You're absolutely right. Let's just keep it here. Okay. Sometimes I find that an awful lot of people move, make the difference between, make the decision for on-prem and off-prem by saying, um, well, do you know what? We're just going to keep everything we've got right now on-premises because we know that works and we're not going to touch that, right? Because, you know, hey, if it's, if it's not broken, you know, don't fix it. And new stuff will push into the cloud. And what happens then is over the, over the period of a, of a few months or a, or a couple of years, you're then looking at this split between prem uh, on-prem and off-prem. It doesn't seem to make any sense of you know, why this data is on-premises and this data is off-premises, other than it's, it's purely historical. You know, it's just because it's always been like that. So I think the point here that, that I'm making is that you know, don't be afraid to have the mix. Don't think it has to be all or nothing. Okay? If it makes sense to keep some stuff on-prem, then do it. And if it doesn't, then you know, feel free to, to push it out onto, uh, into the cloud. Of course, as we, as we said um, in the discussion there, as soon as we start to move data off-premises, security becomes a worry. So there's a few best practices or things that you have to start to think about, okay? <clears throat> and this is something that, that you know, we, it happens 